Thanks. I'm Elvid, your MC for today. So before we start this webinar um, on radiation safety, I would like to share some housekeeping rules that we have here. So the first one, the mics will be muted. Um, turn off your camera. Please be aware that this um, webinar will be recorded. If you're not comfortable being recorded, you can proceed to leave the room. <laughs> You may also type your question and feedback in the chat box. So I will tabulate all this question and ask the, the speaker at the end. Or if you wish to speak or ask any question, you can speak it at the end. And also, there will be a group photo taken at the end of the session. So please turn on your camera at the end and smile. Okay, that's all for the housekeeping rules. So I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Sajis Bapu is currently the chairman of the International Committee for Non-Destructive Tests, ICNDT, Vienna, and the president of the Non-Destructive Testing Society, Singapore, fellow of Non-Destructive Testing Society, Singapore. He worked greatly for the promotion of harmonization in NDT pers personnel certification worldwide in specific to ISO 9712 9, standards and develop recognition of global human resources in NDT. Dr. Bapu has uh, 25 years of international experience in energy, refineries and petrochemical, oil and gas downstream supply chain, building and construction industry in the area of uh, quality testing and inspection, HSC, radiation safety and business development. Currently, he is holding a position of Group HSE and Quality Director with Rotary Engineering Private Limited Singapore, managing over 100 plus HSE personnel. So, without further ado, I'll pass it to Dr. Bapu to share with us on his webinar on radiation safety. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good day, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Alvin. I'd like to share my presentation on the radiation safety for this evening, as well as this morning for some of you. So most of our industry uh, HSE professionals have been uh, very well versed on the day-to-day HSE matters. However, we may have any issues on uh, very particular in terms of radiation safety. So I thought this would be a good session to share and thanks for IOS to give me this opportunity to present it. This uh, presentation will be very much valuable for HSSE managers or any practicing professionals in terms of safety and health of the uh, industry. Today, I will cover quite a number of topics um, starting from a basic radiation physics, radiation sources, radiation quantity and units, and the applications of radiation, and radiation measurements, radiation accidents and emergencies, biological effects of radiation, and the IAEA and ICRP guidelines and regulations, and the last but not least, uh, NEA guidelines in terms of uh, Singapore standards, which is basically adopted from IAEA guidelines. Okay, I'm coming from an organization which is uh, a multinational organization uh, in terms of uh, a very niche area. Many of you may not uh, understand what is NDT. NDT means it's non-destructive testing. So we do have a kind of uh, five decades of uh, history in terms of um, where um, ICNDT has been promoting um, worldwide. And ICNDT is a network of national NDT societies who are to interrupt. Yeah, we can't see your slides. Are you presenting any slides? We just only yes. see you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Actually, I was presenting the slides. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, sorry. So these are the contents of the presentations which I just uh, touched on. Thanks, Abhi. 
On behalf of ICNDT, uh, I'd like to share our vision. ICNDT is a uh, non-profit making organization registered in Vienna. Basically, our members are the national entity societies, and we do have a license status with IAEA to promote atoms for peace. And our vision is to create a safer world through wider use of NDT and diagnostics technology. Uh, just to say, what is NDT? NDT is something uh, you may be using it on your day-to-day -day practice. Either you're taking your transport to office, uh, you're coming on your automobiles, which you could have your spindles, your shafts, everything being inspected before it's putting into an automotive. Or if you're taking a plane, uh, say touchdown uh, to Singapore uh, through uh, British Airways or SQ uh, from London, these aircrafts have been uh, tested and inspected timely with the non-destructive testing, especially on the landing gears. Uh, you talk about tires, we have various NDT methods being done. And one of them is radiographic testing, which has been widely used in the industry. Our vision is also to lead a global network of NDT societies and the groups uh, to promotion of development of science and practice of NDT for the benefits of public worldwide. Without further ado, I'll get into the topic for this uh, one hour session. The first part is the basic radiation physics. You may be wondering what is radiation? Radiation is something all our senses are not able to predict or identify. It's an invisible energy of waves or particles. This makes it more difficult to sense. So it's very important to know, and it's uh, very harmful uh, to our human body. And it's an energy that travels through space and matter. We live with the world where radiation is naturally present. You talk about the cosmic rays, which is coming from the form of light and heat or even our own bodies contain the radioactive isotopes such as carbon-14 or talking about potassium-14. Even in every day in our body, say for example, a guy is weighing 70 kilograms, would have 5,000 becquerels of uh, radiation in his own body. So this is something to understand. We live with the world of radiation. However, we need to know what are the limits set by the standards and what are the limits we can have uh, to be absorbed into the body to ensure the safety for everyone. Broadly, the radiation can be classified into two. Uh, one is ionizing and the other one is non-ionizing radiation. The ionizing is, which is something you could able to remove an electrons completely from an atom. That means ionizing radiation can penetrate through our body and it can damage the cells. While non-ionizing, it's not enough energy to completely remove an atom or electron from an atom. Sometimes you do have alpha rays, which can be stopped by a thin sheet of paper. Or if you talk about beta particle radiation, which can be stopped by a thin sheet of plastic. So that's something we can put it on the non-ionizing radiation. So what we should be worried about is the ionizing radiations. I just tried to put it on an electromagnetic spectrum uh, you may be looking into it, what we have. The radiation is basically, uh, these are the, let me put the laser pointer. These are the uh, short wavelengths, you know, very short wavelengths. And you do have our visible spectrum, which is from 330 nanometers to 770 nanometers. So we can't see this electromagnetic radiation which is produced by any of these rays, uh, including radio, microwaves, or X-rays or gammas. So that makes it more difficult while we are working along, whether there is a presence of radiation or not, we may be not able to see as a safety professionals. Where does this uh, radiation being used in the industry? Very commonly, uh, people working into the oil and gas industry, marine industry, or even talking about construction industry. The industrial radiography is one of the NDT method which is being used to test pipes, wells, which has been put on construction. They either use X-rays or gamma rays. These are very harmful radiation for the human being and it has to be looked, taken to it very carefully. Say for example, um, it's not about radiation safety alone, it's also radiation security. These 
devices can be used as dirty bombs. So it's also quite important uh, in terms of control and use of these uh, uh, devices. The other areas um, you could be able to see where the radiations are used on logging, well logging. Say for example, you have a a uh, heap of soil being um, uh, you know, backfilled and it's being compacted. You want to measure there have been used gauges, nuclear density gauges, or in an offshore platform, it's being used. And the other areas includes, um, which is the nuclear power. Um, unfortunately, in Singapore, we don't have nuclear power, which is one of the green fuel, but many of the countries, uh, even our neighbors say to, uh, Far East, say Korea, South Korea, Japan have been heavily using nuclear power. Almost 20% uh, of the South Korean's uh, uh, energy has been utilized. Germany is one of the country which has been moving out from nuclear power on the last uh, decades. And there are also, you know, crises has been seen when it's been mishandled. However, you know, as a guy who is encouraged nuclear for peace, um, I would say it's still a very safe uh, power. But look into it. When you see the nuclear power plants, it emits a very small amount of radiation, which is less than one milligram per year because it's been structured in a way. However, if it is talking about mines where the processing of uranium is there, there you have a, a, quite a significant amount of uh, radiation, but it's still very low compared to what is being allowed to the public. Later on, I'll touch down on the effects of radiation. Okay, just to give a quick highlight, the industrial radiography is uh, very common for NDT. You might be seeing as a safety officer, there will be some night shift activities you'll be allowing the people to come and do. Sometimes you often don't know what sort of control measures they should have. So I believe this lecture would help you all. Most often this is uh, predominantly used for metal fabrications as well as oil and gas industry as I touched. Um, it's very similar to what you do with your body when you want to do a uh, health X-ray, say for example, you want to determine your uh, fracture locations in um, injuries, exactly what has been used, but you will be using a very low energy for human tissues when they do the X-ray. Okay, to go a little, Touched on on physics, as I told you earlier, there are two ways of uh, radiation which will be used commonly in the industry. One is the gamma radiography. The other one is the X-ray radiography. If it is the X-ray radiography, it means when you have power is turned on, you do have X-rays, which is also you could see on a couple of slides later. But the good thing is I need power to turn on X-rays and I can switch it off when I don't need it. So it's quite a safe uh, device. However, it's more or less used on laboratory purposes. It may be not portable to use on the industrial spaces, say on the pipe racks or inside a vessel or tanks. And you will see a lot of uh, gamma radiography is being used. That is where isotopes come in. If I put a simple note, isotopes are atoms of same element having same atomic number, but different mass number. And they are unstable and they're radioactive. The most common isotopes being used in the industry is iridium-192, whereas iridium-191 is a stable atom and uh, 192 is an isotope of it, which can emit radiation, which is commonly used. The second isotopes which has been used in the industry is the cesium, uh, sorry, uh, selenium-175, or the next one is cesium-137. This you will see later on. All these isotopes produce all these three. It can produce an alpha particle, it has a beta, then you have a gamma. While alpha and beta are not so key, as I told you earlier, it will be stopped and it doesn't ionize um, uh, in terms of body tissues. And you do have gamma rays, which really uh, penetrating radiation, it can penetrate several uh, mm of steel and to several inches of uh, concrete in terms of things. I can later uh, touch down on what sort of penetration it has. However, on any uh, destroying thing, naturally God has given certain kind of uh, uh, creativity to it. it. It has a life. So any isotopes 
uh, will not live forever, it has a decay principle stuck to it, which is always an advantage for it. Say, for example, today you have 100 curies. Curie is a method of uh, measuring an activity of an isotope. So in certain period of time, it will become half. So 100 curies will become 50 curies. That is called half-life. So every safety person should know what is the half-life of an isotope being used in its vicinity, which tells him um, what is the activity and what is the decay, which is very important to estimate the distance, safe distance from the isotope being uh, to be used. So in a typical sense where I touched down earlier, Iridium-192 as an 74.5 days half-life. You can put it as 75 days. So in 150 days, it will become another half. So the disintegration is uh, uh, very dynamic and you could see you will have uh, four times, uh, four half-lives in the um, 150 days. So that helps us to reduce the value and it will be safer to use a lower activity. So this can be utilized uh, formula, which is uh, uh, activity at the time, what you want to see, which is equal to the initial activity over e power minus 0.693 over half value, uh, half life. 693 is a constant, and then your decay time, which should be the number of days uh, or years, whatever you want to put in. And then T is basically the half life, which is, comes from this table. So for example, if you got 150 days, you put 150 here, and this is 75, and the initial activity is 100, then you calculate you'll be having 50 in 150 days. Similarly, there are other isotopes which are very highly penetrating in radiation like cobalt 60, which can penetrate more than 100 mm of steel. So in the marine industry where they build the ships, they do have these isotopes which are very dangerous and they used to keep inside the uh, heavy storage and it's been not commonly used on open field. It's been used on a, a controlled area. You also may ask these cobalt 60 has been used also in smaller quantity for treating cancer, basically to destroy the cells, cancer cells. Okay, how do you know as a safety officer, what is the current activity of isotope? Usually every radiographer or the guy who is performing this task, including the radiation safety officer, he should carry the decay chart. So as a HSE officer, you always can demand the subcontractors who are performing this work or the laboratories who are performing this work to show this decay chart where you can able to see the current activity. I'll try to push down on X-ray. X-ray is something which I told you, uh, it's a production of uh, 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 radioactive uh, rays, but however, you have the electrons coming from the cathode ray tube, it's on a target, which is a tungsten filament, and then you have your X-rays being produced. There are two types of uh, rays. We call it as characteristics X-ray, and we call it as continuous X-ray, which is the Bremstrong radiation. Characteristics means if an electron is pushed from one of the uh, shells. So for example, if the electron is pushed from a K-shell, then it will be called K-characteristic X-ray. So here, if I increase the voltage of the, uh, the uh, electrons, which is coming, uh, will have higher energy of X-rays. So if I increase the current, then you have high intensity of X-ray. So for example, in the industrial use, you will see the X-ray energy is between 150 kilo voltage to 300 kilo voltage, which is uncommonly used. But if I go into a a factory where a casting is produced, it will have 1 million volts, uh, which is 1 million electron volts, which is very high energy of uh, X-ray. So in normal uh, body, human tissues will be using between uh, 50 kV, which is very low. And you can see the test will be a fraction of a second. Uh, they will just turn it on and turn it off. You might have noticed. So it's not really uh, giving you a huge amount of just to take a look, uh, this is how a typical uh, X-ray tube will looks like. Uh, and these are uh, a very special glasses, which has the, uh, the energization takes place and then you will have your X-rays produced. Okay, 
I'm not going into detail how we produce x-rays, but at least you have an idea of what this does. Okay, so there are many ways these photons, when I say photons, it can be x-ray or gamma ray, interact with matter. But this uh, interaction is, happens on three bases. One is called photoelectron absorption. The second one is Compton scattering and third one is pair productions. So anything less than 150 kV, you will have around photoelectron absorptions and 150 to around uh, one MeV, you will have the Compton scattering and more than one MeV, you will have the pair productions. That means you will have a positive electron and uh, neg uh, positron, we call it as, and then the electron will be produced, two pair productions will be produced. So this is how the um, uh, photons from gamma or X will interact in your body or interact with the matter, say for example, steel. Okay, so I touched down on the basic physics. I move on to a little bit on quantities of radiation. So the basic uh, quantity which you all need to know is activity. So when you talk about isotopes, we always used to say Curie. It's been comes from Madame Curie who has been a uh, uh, person who has invented. And then uh, the new unit is called Becquerel. One Curie uh, is equal to 37 uh, giga Becquerel or 3.7 into 10 power nine Becquerel. That is the SI unit. So you could uh, see uh, if I say 100 Curies, you can see it's how many Becquerels of radiation. And one becquerel means it's one transformation or disintegrations per second. That is called the activity. So we move on with the second uh, unit. It's Rongen. Rongen is the intensity of radiation, which is uh, what the, uh, when you talk about, it can be X, it can be gamma. When it's coming out from the uh, device, you measure it in terms of Rongen's. And these Rongen's are uh, not, uh, it's a unit based on time. So if you're talking about you have a one hour exposure, you call it as rongens per hour. And one rongen is 1000 millirongen. So we have to look into millirongens. But if you go into a nuclear plant, the emission will be in rongens per hour. In our industrial radiography, it will be millirongens per hour. Sorry to say that it's very common to have the old units as well as the new units. New units are millisieverts. Yeah. And this radiation, when it's uh, uh, interacting with human body, we call it as rad or radiation absorbed dose. One, ron one rad is equal to one rongen basically in terms of things. And then the SI unit is called gray. Again, one gray is 100 uh, rad. Okay, that's something I want to touch down on the unit. So when you talk about as a safety officer in the field, you will see MR or MSV, these two units you will see, or micro sievert you will see on the uh, radiation detectors. So to summarize in terms of units for activity, you call it as Becquerel. Uh, in terms of uh, measurement of radiation, you call it as dose equivalent, that is in sieverts or in REM. So you talk about one sievert is under REM. When it is uh, interacting with body, you call it as RAD. So 100 rad is one gray. So if you got a dose report from a laboratory like NEA here in Singapore, National Environmental Agency, they will say how many gray is being uh, absorbed by this uh, person who has been come in contact with radiation. Okay, so let's go on to the third topic in terms of applications. So as I told you, we have these uh, wider applications, industrial radiography, power generation, sterilizations, gauging device, and well logging. This is quite common in entire part of the world where you will see and come across industrial radiation. Okay. This is a device which is called a gamma projector. You will see in sight. It looks very fancy, right? So someone, a common people who doesn't know what is this, it may be even stolen in some of the countries. There are many cases if these devices has been stolen and people try to see something interesting to solve for value for money, but it's very important. And you can see a trifoil symbol. That's uh, 
the uh, symbol which uh, depicts it's a radioactive material. And this is one of the uh, projector which has been produced by United States. It's called uh, uh, Sentinel and it's very common. And uh, you could see some tubes. These tubes are the tubes which will be transporting the isotope from this container to a location where it's need the radiation to be exposed. So as long the isotope is inside this container is safe. Once it comes out of this container, the radiation is continuously emitting. So that is the interesting part of it. And these guide tubes are usually 15 meters. And um, the operator who is allowed to operate this have a kind of control, uh, say in Singapore, we call it as R1 worker, which is a radiation worker. It's the same way uh, in any country, these radiation workers are quite controlled and they are monitored as well. So they have been given some uh, monitoring tools I will show to you later on. And so without that, you are not authorized to go close to it. As a safety officer, you doesn't need to be close to these devices, but you will be staying far away from these devices. But you should be monitoring whether the devices are safe. They are not giving any leaks, which are over the control uh, from the permissible uh, values. Okay. You can see a little black little uh, stuff there. That is where the isotope is staying, and he is staying in the S type somewhere here. And this is a depleted uranium shielding. The, you see the good thing uh, in the old time, we used to have uh, in the 80s or uh, early 90s, we used to have lead shielding. So these device will be very heavy. And nowadays this has been used depleted uranium shielding. The, that means the shielding itself is a radioactive material, unfortunately, but they are very low. They call type A package. But when the isotope is inside, it's a type BU package, which is a, uh, uh, quite a heavy amount of radiation will be have there, but it's still safe. You are not good. Even you stay there close to one hour, it's still safe. I will come to you why I always say, use the word, it's still safe, yeah? Okay, you can see this is a device. Earlier I show you in a very fancy yellow, yellow color device, which is the Sentinel. This is the old type, but I just want to show you, this is called the front guide tube where people will be connecting uh, or the radiation worker will be connecting this. So that means when you crank it, the isotope will leave this premises and go through this tube. Believe me, this tube is just a plastic tube. It doesn't have any things. So once it's out from this uh, container, the isotope is emitting uh, quite a significant amount of radiation. There are many incidents happens. The isotope stuck in this tube and then doesn't return back to the container. And people carry this tube in the car where say, for example, in Middle East, from a site to a residence or to a, to a storage facility, it will take 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers. So these radiation workers are being exposed to the radiation and then they got injured. So this is something, if it is in a very crowded uh, city, if they are carrying this, it's really very dangerous. So that's why when they leave the site, they need to ensure their isotopes are back into the things. If you lost an isotope in a site, then it's called a radiation incident. And um, we as HSE officers has to play a significant part in ensuring these isotopes has been retracted carefully. And that is called radiation emergency. And you will be activating SEDF or uh, NEA here to make sure that has been uh, actively taken back uh, to its position. So however, there are maintenance tools are available to ensure these cranking devices are working carefully. There is no loss of uh, things. But for all this, we have one tool to measure. These are called radiation survey meters. So that is an important tool as a safety officer or safety professional to ensure there is a radiation safety uh, survey meter works on the premises when this kind of activity is taken place and ensure those devices are calibrated and those devices are working. So usually there is a battery check is there. So it ensures, uh, even though there is no radiation, it will show that the battery check is working. So that are the two important checks. So this is one of the device, which I told you for X-ray, this will looks like that. It has a power. So it's a control panel where people can operate from the control panel. And this is the uh, X-ray tube 
where you will have the energized uh, radiation will be coming out. So you might have seen this uh, quite often in the medical kind of laboratory, but this is similar setup. Okay, as I told you, all our senses, six senses, uh, unfortunately cannot detect radiation. So we have to rely on radiation monitoring instruments. So there are two type of instruments are there. Uh, we call it as dosimeter, which is a kind of a pocket dosimeter used to be kept with the, uh, uh, you know, the operators or the guy who is performing any activity associated with radiation. The other one is called survey meter. So we as a safety officers need to look into these devices which are available wherever this activity is being carried. So once you turn on, you could be able to see in millirongens per hour or uh, micro sieverts per hour, uh, the amount of radiation level being there when a device is being operated. So just to show you, this shows now, it's a very simple instrument. You have the menu to switch on between milliram and ram or uh, even in sieverts. And uh, you can have a battery check and then it's ready to go. You can set audible alarms so that no need to see and uh, you are able to measure what level of radiation is there. So every country has a limit set, what should be the permissible radiation level for common public? You and me are called common public. Anybody who is given a uh, thermal luminescence dosimeter, we call TLD badges, they are called radiation workers. So they can have a higher level of radiation limit, but for public, there is a limit specified and that is what the limit we have to see when we use the barricaded area should have that limit should be seen from this survey meter. So then you can give a, your permit to work system can capture this and then say, okay, done the survey, you're allowed to perform whatever the data. This is one pocket dosimeter. This is an instant dosimeter, which will be kept by the uh, radiographers or the guy who is performing these activities. And uh, it can be seen instantly after he finishes work, how much amount of radiation he got. So he can also monitor regularly on a day-to-day -day basis, how much radiation, because um, those dosimeters, which has been monitored by the uh, national laboratory will be given every month. They will have this every month uh, the results. This is one typical example of uh, uh, TLD badges or film badges is being uh, used or monitored on him. Uh, monthly basis. Please make sure that the person who are working within your premises, or, uh, they should have this film badge and they should wear this film badge on the chest um, uh, to ensure that they are being monitored. And some of the bad practices you might see, um, these uh, controlled uh, workers may put these uh, film badges far away in their car or in their vehicle to, you know, just to uh, fake um, that they don't get any radiation because if they reach their limit, they will be stopped working. When they will reach the limit, they have unsafe practices. That means they are very close to the radiation level. They are getting more radiation then they are having unsafe practices. So this is something as a safety officer to look into it, to make sure that the guys who are supposed to work carrying the film badge and they are wearing it, promptly on their chest and at all times while performing this work. So this is uh, two types they have. They call it as film batch, which is uh, they, it's basically a uh, film, uh, which able to see what sort of exposures, what sort of radiation they have been received. The other one is a TLD batch, which is a thermoluminescence dosimeter. So once they take this uh, dosimeter from inside and put it on a heater, and uh, they, it will emit the uh, uh, thermal luminescence and which can be measured on the uh, device itself to see. But this all done in a laboratory uh, aspect and which we are not able to control it. The authorities usually issue this and when they can perform. And this is very fast actually giving the results. In Singapore, um, they use TLD badges. And similarly, uh, in some of the countries uh, in UK, say for example, they also use TLD badges. Okay, now I come to some uh, interesting topics, uh, radiation accidents and emergencies. As I told you, uh, 
any radiation is harmful to our health. So we should look into the principle of ALARA as low as reasonably achievable. So these are some of the um, uh, incidents uh, which you have seen. Uh, either it could be the, um, uh, through nuclear power plants or through um, industrial uh, radiographic work. And these incidents are very disastrous. And you could have serious injuries uh, to the, to the um, body tissues, or you could have a kind of long-term effects. You could have genetic effects. Just to show you, this is in severe injuries to a non-radiation worker. He's not a worker who has been paid for, but he tried to see um, a shiny little object uh, at the end of the shift and he thought it's something he can make money out of it and he carry in his shirt pocket and he's been exposed for almost one and a half hours and he have reached almost um, uh, the whole body dose of two to five grays which is basically all his white blood cell has been damaged and then he has reached to the uh, case of nearly to the NVD syndrome, which is a nausea, vomiting, diarrhea syndrome. And then he has local burn. This is a one earlier case, very early case in the 90s. You know, there was an incident in uh, Peru where a guy has been exposed with uh, uh, almost 1.37 terabecurals of uh, uh, radiography uh, isotope being used. And he has been... Uh, determined after two days after the incidents, he got a blister on the upper thigh. Okay, so these incidents are avoidable. Where you can uh, fix it is most important is monitoring. So when you see the regulatory framework that has been determined, uh, the reasons of uh, uh, these incidents are mainly lack of authorization, lack of inspection, and lack of enforcement. And uh, on a management level, inadequate safety culture, and also quality control, there is no training and qualifications of workers for these radiation workers. But these incidents are very uh, harmful and dangerous to health. So, you could have various reasons of an uh, radiation accident. It could be very common reason is due to acumen failure. As I explained to you, the isotopes can be left from the, uh, the secured container. It could be left in one of those guide tubes and which is a, one of the common incident. But definitely if a person is monitoring when he finishes the work, he checks, it's, uh, the area is free, then you should be able to determine this. Or in a case like um, there is lack of training basically and uh, not following the safety procedures, which for example, they shortcut, they do have a kind of device called collimators, which will have lower radiation. People sometimes tend to be lazy and not to use this device while doing the radiography. So you have a lot of radiation being leaked. Or People may think that, oh, it is just one or two exposure. Okay, I don't do my barricades. I quickly do this. But while they're doing this work, somebody enters into the premises where this activity is happening. So there is no adequate control of permitting systems. So lack of safety programs. These are some of the causes for such emergencies or accidents. Okay, we learned something about uh, the incidents and accidents. Uh, what happens uh, in terms of biological effects of radiation? Okay, uh, I will set, come to the limits later. So there are quite a number of uh, um, effects could happen. So these effects could, uh, based on the total dose, what has been absorbed by the body, and also the type of cell it affects and type of radiation. Here I would say, the uh, gamma radiation is one of the worst, and also X-ray, and also the age of individual, whether the age is close to a reproductive age or a female who is uh, pregnant and carrying a, a baby in the womb, which is very uh, sensible for them. 
and also what part of body is being exposed. Say, for example, uh, it's, a, it's a hand or it's a genital parts is being exposed uh, close to the things and what type of tissue volume is being exposed and what is the interval of dose has been received, whether the dose has been received continuous or it's been taken at a periodic time, uh, say in terms of months or years. So these are the things would determine uh, whether uh, the uh, acute dose or it's a chronic effect that happens. Okay, so the first uh, basic effect uh, happens is, as I told you earlier, any radiation comes into your body, what happens? It's ionized. So that means it breaks your cell. So any radiation comes in, it breaks your cell, but it also depends on what energy it's been going through into your body, right? So if a cell breaks, it will join again. You know, after a period of time, you, we have the healing in our nature. But on a certain cases, uh, it won't be able to join in the same way. It may be have a different way of joining that is called uh, genetic effects where you will have chromosome abbreviations. So that's something I uh, would like to say. After a period of time, the cells can be repaired and it can be continuously healed. Or in other cases, if the radiation is very high dose, then you will have mutated cells and these mutated cells will go into the subsequent generation and you will have genetic effects. So which is very serious in nature. So I broadly classify the effects into somatic effects and genetic effects, okay? And these somatic effects can be further classified into a non-stochastic, which means high dose in a short time or a stochastic effect, low dose in a long time. A yeah, radiation worker will be in this class, stochastic effects. While also uh, in a radiation emergency, like an accident happens, that would be a non-stochastic effect, okay? Let's go through further what type of radiation exposure will give you uh, what sort of clinical effects. So up to 0.5 sieverts or up to 50 rongens, okay? You won't have any uh, basic uh, effect, you will see some drop in red blood cells. Or if you get 100 uh, rongens or one sievert in terms of radiation, then you will see a drop in uh, white blood cells. Any exposure up to 300 rem, you will have radiation sickness, which we call NVD syndrome, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. This is one of the uh, earlier symptoms to see and then you have loss of hair, all these symptoms will come. Any absorbed dose more than 3.5 gray or 350 R, you will have LD, uh, uh, LD uh, 50 by 60, which means 50% of people will die in 60 days. Any dose which is 800 uh, uh, REMS will have death almost certain. I can tell you, uh, a radiation device in Singapore is being authorized up to um, 50 curies, okay? Just to give you an example, okay? Please take note, 50 curies. While in Europe or in UK or even in Middle East, it's been authorized up to 100 curies to be used in the industrial radiograph, okay? You can ask me a question. How much radiation does a 50 Curie source emit? So a 50 Curie Iridium-192 will emit 25 R per hour, okay? So it's 0.5 into 50, 25 R per hour at one meter distance, okay? At one meter distance, it will emit 25 R per hour. So if a guy is holding an isotope in his pocket, or if he's working close in say 100 cm, you know the radiation is very high and you can even reach the lethal dose in less than 20 minutes. So which is what I say a radiation incident in industrial radiography is very critical.
and very dangerous. Okay, uh, in terms of stochastic effect, uh, it's a long-term uh, illness which can come for radiation worker, which doesn't have any limits as well. It can be skin cancer such as leukemia or cataracts. So uh, we always say uh, when you talk about cancer, uh, less than 5% of the people who are in a routine uh, radioactive uh, uh, radiation worker uh, gets uh, a cancer. So less than 5%. But our 95% people are general public who are not into the uh, radiation field. So the stochastic effect for a radiation worker, it's very minimum from the last uh, 100 years of uh, 100 plus years of uh, discovery of Ranjan and it's been used. Okay, you could see the damages uh, which I told you, the skin burn, which has been exposed less than one hour uh, with these kind of isotopes, it's uh, crazy. And genetic effects, you could have uh, improper limb growths, uh, color blindness, all sort of things uh, for a child being born to a person who has been exposed to this radiation. So which is, we cannot get back this again once this happens. So that is something uh, not to see. Okay, um, if you'd like to see more on to the, uh, uh, to know more about um, uh, radiation safety in terms of a guide, please go through IAEA publications. This link will be available once uh, when we share this presentation, you could download this. And this is a very useful tool for every one of the uh, uh, safety professional who wants to know a little bit more in terms of radiation safety. Okay. Now I come back to the radiation doses limits. Okay. Uh, you can always ask me, uh, uh, what is the benefit of being a radiation worker, oh, it's very dangerous. Uh, if someone is working in the radiation field, I would say for any work, you do have a risk as a safety professional. You all know you evaluate your risk and opportunities at the same time, the risk, you also have risk-taking behavior in certain aspects and you do allow certain amount of risk uh, in, in work. And however, you do have mitigation measures. Um, I don't know how many of you has been uh, uh, smokers uh, in the audience. Uh, there is a say, or not, it's a say, it's a, it's a medical uh, research. A person who smokes 20 cigarettes a day, uh, I'll, I'll put it another way. A person who take 20 millirangians uh, of radiation a day, who is basically a classified worker, loses 28 days in his lifetime, okay? A person who take 20 ml of alcohol, say uh, routinely, he loses almost 300 days in his lifetime. A person who smokes 20 cigarettes a day lose 925 days in his lifetime. So this is a clinical research and it's uh, proven and it's there. So. Compared to that, the radiation risk is very much lower for the radiation worker. And this uh, risk has been put in place, uh, reducing all the natural radiation, what we are getting, even in our own body, as I told you at the start of the presentation, we do have our own isotopes in our body, which is giving certain amount of radiation, which our tissues are able to handle. Okay. So anyone who works uh, in, a, in a radiation industry, it's called as classified worker, and they should be at least 18 years or older, and they should be declared medically fit, and they should have an annual medical examinations before they are allowed to work. So if you have encountered uh, anybody, if uh, working in this uh, under your supervision, you could ensure do they have the regular checks. As long as they have been issued with the national um, test uh, monitoring badges, that means this has been checked. And without that, the authorities will not be issuing them the monitoring badge. This table is an extract uh, from uh, SI3232, which is a statutory documents of ionizing radiation published since 1999, and it's very valid. So a radiation worker will be allowed to take maximum of 20 millisieverts or 2,000 millirangians or two rangians per year. However, yeah, 
public or any other person who are not a classified worker only allowed to take one millisievert per year, which is basically one twentieth of the allowed radiation uh, they can take. And um, these are some of the exposures as given based on the allowable uh, limits. You look into it. If uh, I come into an uh, age of uh, 20 and become a classified worker, uh, I'm going to take uh, 20 MSV, which is uh, roughly 2R. So um, I'm going to get retired at the age of 60. So accumulative dose, I'm going to get 40 times 40 times two, which is almost 80 R uh, in terms of uh, rongens. So you might have seen in my previous slide, anything more than uh, 100 Rs or one uh, sieverts, you will see um, there is some changes on the white blood cell. This is how the limits has been arrived. So medically, it is not giving any changes. So of course, you will have a small amount of damages, which any radiation will ionize your body. Okay? So these are the dose limits has been specified in, even in Singapore, we have the Radiation Protection Act. It's an extract. And uh, for radiation worker in Singapore is the whole body dose is 20 MSV a year, average over five years. So in one year he can have, because he may come across some radiation emergencies, he is allowed to take 50 MSV in one single year. However, when he take 50 MSV, the next four years he left with only 10 MSV per year. That means average, you can take 20 MSV a year. Yeah, that's the thing. And for general public, exactly following the previous slide, which is one MSV per year. So based on this, you can say, what should be the amount of radiation you can allow per hour? So how do they calculate is, um, they calculate based on uh, uh, 50 weeks, uh, uh, per uh, year. So you divide this value by 50. So you get a weekly dose and then you say 40 hours per week. Uh, then you divide by 40, then you know per hour what is the allowable dose at the barricaded area. So you as a radiation um, monitors, uh, when there is an activity happening, you can use your survey meter to ensure this limit has been uh, followed by the radiation workers. So how do we uh, take precautions that we are not exposed to a heavy amount of radiation? The first basic principle, it's very similar to our other safety uh, risk um, taking practices as low as reasonably achievable. Alara is a principle being used. So, and the second one is called time distance shielding. And you do should have the control areas uh, and you should have a supervised area. That means at the barricades, you should have certain amount of in the night, you should have a reflective uh, uh, reflectors, which could be a battery operator or power operators or warning signs to ensure no public entering uh, behind the barricade. And you should have a uh, person who is monitoring these areas that nobody accidentally entering inside. And the other one is certain local rules to be followed. Okay. Uh, you may see uh, some of these uh, labels, uh, which I thought of uh, giving a quick note. Uh, when you see this trifoil symbol, it's very clear, it's radiation, and you know um, the uh, dangerous goods classification is seven, and the transport uh, uh, UN code is 2982 for this. And activity is one of the things they need to put, how many curies, and what it contains. It can say if it contains iridium, then put it uh, iridium. So if you see a label with white, it's very less. And if you see a label with uh, uh, yellow and with three uh, dashes, radioactive three, which is, means very high amount of radiation. And there is also a, a important thing they call TI, transport index. This is very important to ship the radioactive material in air. So if the transport index is uh, more than 10, then it's called uh, um, uh, radioactive three. For you, a simple answer is what is meaning of 10 is it is emitting 10 MR per hour from the package. So if a transport index is two, it can be emitting uh, up to one MR per hour from the package at one meter distance. Whenever I say one MR per hour, when I say always it's 
measuring a one meter distance from the package and then surface level is this. When these two criteria is met, then they will say it's LO2. Most common you will see is LO2 when they see. Uh, this means it's still very hazardous uh, package. Okay, how do you protect yourself? Uh, basically spend less exposures to radiation and keep as much as possible adequate distance uh, from any of these devices. And of course you have protective shielding. So for example, if there is a concrete column in the, uh, in the uh, building, then you stay behind the concrete column, it's itself a shielding. Or if you talk about a heavy steel structures are there, you're standing behind uh, um, steel structures that it also is shielding. So spend less time, spend more distance, move away from it and uh, uh, less, uh, more shielding is required so that you can keep this radiation level. And believe it, uh, this radiation works on the principle of inverse viola. That means initial intensity or final intensity is equal to uh, distance uh, two square or D1 square, which is the D1 is always one, one meter. As I told you, you are measuring uh, the radiation level with your survey meters. Then you can say, uh, what is the distance required for the cordon off of this radiation? So these are uh, some of the principal tools, spend less uh, time and the exposure is coming into it. And that is basically what is the dose you have been obtained uh, while doing with the close presence. So if you see, uh, this is uh, one of the devices I told you, and uh, they are using this to uh, take a radiography of a welded pipe and basically there is no shielding. If you stand just here, you are just exposed to radiation and uh, it's uh, very good. It will be, air is a good medium and you'll be reaching it. But if you stay behind this uh, blue curtain across outside of this uh, workshop, you will be having less radiation. And where you can see, you can only uh, see through these monitors, okay? Just uh, to give you an example, these principles use shielding. And, uh, these are some of the radiation emergencies, uh, which are lead sheets, lead shards, and some kind of tongs uh, to have remote handling tongs. And these are called collimators, which is made up of lead, uh, which is being used to reduce the radiation level when they do this radiographic uh, works. So the most important part of uh, limiting to any incidents is, uh, the first thing is training and ensure the equipments are well maintained and somebody is uh, giving these maintenance report and control of your operations. That will put a better safety culture. These radiation sources are widely used. Of course, they are with substantial benefits, but it can cause harmful effect, including death if it has been treated. So you are to value a risk. So the benefits are a lot compared to the risk. So it's still been widely used in the industry uh, to help us uh, in doing our construction or monitoring of uh, activities. So there are many references. You could take a look into it. I would suggest uh, this presentation, I put it in uh, referring to all these guidelines. And uh, when you are free, please go through it and you will be able to get a better uh, knowledge of radiation safety. With this, uh, I think I have reached uh, almost to my time of the presentation and uh, I'll be happy to take questions on this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bapu. Um, I have a few questions that I have written down based on what the audience have written in the chat box. So here I go. I think there's around 16. Yeah. Okay. The first one will be what is HLV, hub value layer? Okay, the half value layer is the thickness of a material which reduces the radiation intensity to half. For example, if uh, we are using a iridium-192 isotope, the steel half value layer is 12.5. So that means you have 100 millirangians per hour. If I have a 12.5 mm thickness, you will have 50 millirangians per hour on the other side. So I increase now my thickness to 25, then it's become one fourth. If I increase to 100, then it's become one sixteenth. Same if the material change from steel to concrete, then you talk about 44 mm of concrete will reduce one half. 
So that is the HVL. But if I change the radioactive isotope from iridium to cobalt, I need 66 mm of concrete instead of 44 mm of concrete. Okay, thank you. Okay, the second one will be, what is the conversion factor from one unit to the other? I believe the, the audience were asking like from Becquerel, how do you change to gray to sievert? Is there a quick brief way, how do you convert this conversion factor? As I mentioned earlier, the Becquerel is only an activity. So it is, uh, it, the, uh, the unit is, uh, which is uh, 3.7 into 10 power 10, uh, Becquerel is equal to one Curie, okay? So that is an activity. It doesn't have any connection with the, uh, the um, uh, you cannot directly use it uh, in terms of the radiation uh, measurements, which is the millirongens per hour, which is common, uh, what you will see. But uh, always you could able to see is uh, one gray or one sievert is equal to 100 rongens. That is the uh, most common, uh, unit which will be you will be using okay, the third question will be need some information on the photoelectric effect so maybe you can just briefly share more a bit more information on photoelectric effect okay so um, i could explain it but it would be good with a nice picture i, I have a lot of pictures but you know with the time limit of the presentation i thought i didn't put those pictures I can explain that. Say, for example, you have a photon, um, which is a X or gamma is coming in. And this X and gamma is completely absorbed on a material, which could be steel, it could be lead. And it emits one electron from the material. And this electron is out, ejected from the material itself. Then it's called photoelectron effect. Okay, it's anything happens less than 100 keV of energy, you will have photoelectron. Mm -hmm. Got it. The fourth question, I think, what are the radiation control measures? I believe the slides you have already provided it. Uh, Alara, try to keep as low as possible and also time distance in shooting. Is that right? Yes, correct. Absolutely. Uh, the other, another question is throw some light on laser radiation. Yeah. Okay, laser radiation is uh, not non-ionizing radiation, so it's very much uh, safe and it's uh, unharmful to as an absorption to the body. But however, it's harmful to your eyes. So that's where we have, uh, you know, uh, control measures. You have a certain amount of lenses to be used to limit the amount of radiation reaching your eyes. Yeah. Other than that, it doesn't. It uh, destroys your cells. So it's a non-ionizing radiation. Uh, sixth question will be, what are the health effects from radiation exposure? So I believe your slides on the biological effect has covered that. So yeah, do you want to add on more on what are the health effects? Yeah, as I told you, the health effect is uh, primarily uh, for the routine workers, uh, routine radiation workers, or classified workers. Uh, you don't see any health effects, as I told you. Uh, even myself, I in my earlier ages, I worked in a nuclear reactor, which has an emission of uh, uh, almost 100 rogens an hour. That means I stay there one hour, I could have reached my the first dose where my red blood cells is gone. So we taken uh, with four control workers taking a time there, we less than two minutes, we did our task, whatever the task. And then the other guy comes in, he puts on the things. So that is how uh, we are worked on. But those exposures are uh, because I spend less time. I didn't spend one hour. So I spent two minutes. So that was the exposure. I got it. So you can divide by 60 and you can say how much exposure I would have get. So I get my one year dose in that two minutes, actually. I get my one year dose in two minutes, but it doesn't destroy my cells because I told you, you need 50 rongens to see any effect to your cells. But however, there will be some ionization happens. So uh, in terms of classified workers, unless and until they reach a radiation accident, which I told you, you come in close contact with the isotope directly. By right, we should not be, right? 
These isotopes are on the remote operations of 15 meters, and you are not able to be at, at close to the operation. But if there is an emergency happen, and I didn't use my radiation survey meter to monitor, then I come in close contact because there is a radiation there. Then that could be dangerous. We could lead to all these three effects. First is the uh, 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 cell abbreviation, uh, which I told you, effect to the cells. And the second one is uh, your chromosome abbreviation. And third one is the NVD syndrome. And then LD50 by 60. And finally, death based on the amount of exposures what we get. Uh, maybe a bit time for social media. We'll just do another two to three minutes of uh, Q&A. Yeah, sure. Uh, another one will be with the accidents of nuclear power plant in Fukushima, Japan, back in 2011 for 10 years now. How do we know the radiation is safe and managed as this could be mutagenic reaction to marine life? So this is one of the questions. Another one will be the Fukushima same question is that in April this year, uh, for the Japanese government announced its formal decision to discharge the treated water store at the Fukushima Daiichi site. They will be discharging into the sea. So the concern is uh, how will this affect public health and how will this affect the marine life and including seafood from Japan? Okay, it's a very, very good question. Of course, uh, the Fukushima uh, incident, it's a um, very big disaster in terms of uh, also um, it's a crisis and um, it's a natural disaster. However, the Japanese authorities has put a lot of measures to control. First is evacuation. Basically, they have done a huge evacuation and it's very similar to the Chernobyl incidents, but Chernobyl incident took too long to do all these evacuations. What they have done is they have done shielded as I told you, you might have seen from a nuclear reactor dome outside, you have less than one millirangens per hour in terms of radiation there. So the exposure is even lower than the cosmic waves, what we get on natural. So that's the uh, engineering basis of uh, designing a reactor. But however, the uh, heavy water, which has been uh, contaminated with radiation is still there. And they wait until for a period of time to have these radiation level to be decayed. As I told you, the disintegration happens every hour, every minute it happens. So based on the isotopes presence in these heavy water and it has been decayed. And I also explained in our body, we do have an isotope on its own. It's emitting 5,000 becquerel for a, for a 70 kilo person. You do have, we consume a lot of potassium and we do have the isotopes being produced. So in a sense, uh, these values are uh, very low in, in terms of it's ready to be close to the natural radiation, what we are getting from the minerals and soils where you have a higher level uh, atmosphere. So definitely it's safe for the humans uh, to be uh, to be exposed to that level of radiation, what is being ready to be discharged into the sea. However, we always say any radiation is harmful, okay? Because it ionizes. So you do have the fishes or the marine life could have been exposed to this radiation. However, that doesn't damage the cells of that fish and it can still be there. And this, ra this radiation, as I told you, it's once passed through the fish, it's been ionized. It is not a particle radiation, it's, it's, um, it's uh, ionizing radiation. So we, when we consume these fishes, it's not we are taking this radiation back to our human body. So uh, in a way, it's been scientifically proven and safe, and it is not like anyhow sending the radiation, exporting from one location to other location. I believe every uh, borders uh, would take a precedence uh, in terms of sending something waste. You know, uh, just for example, in my country here in Singapore, we don't have uh, even a huge storage for radioactive waste. That's one of the reasons we have a very short land here. And that's one of the reasons we even don't have a nuclear facility or things because we, we have a difficulty in treating it. We have a difficulty in holding it for a period of time to hold it, although we have a lot of undergrounds. But 
maybe country like China, United States, or Europe even big, you have massive land, you have place to store it. And to, so there are ways to handle this safely. So that's the reason. And uh, I would say uh, it's not like uh, any nuclear reactor or nuclear energy is unsafe. Thank you. Thank you, Babu. It's such a very informative and in-depth sharing on radiation safety. So thank you so much. So it's good to know that uh, my one guru has said she can still enjoy her sashimi from Japan. Okay, without further ado, I would like to, to invite uh, Nuru, our chair of IOSH Singapore branch, to present a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Babu. Nuru, please. Hello, thank you so much for the welcome, Elvin. And another, uh, once again, Dr. Babu, it's been a great pleasure and you've got, it's been insightful and it's very informative um, for all of the sharing that you've done with radiation. Thank you so much. And as a way of thanking you for your time, um, this is your certificate of appreciation. Um, this is to present to you. Um, unfortunately, you can't really see that well. Thank you. I received it. Uh, <laughs> you see, I received it here. Very nice. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much, Dr. Babu. Appreciate it. Um, I think just before we wrap up, if we, if we could all turn on our video and we can do a, a group session, a group photo taking. We're waiting. I'm at the gallery view now, so uh, it's quite a few people in my Okay, look at the camera. One, two, three. Smile. Give me one more shot. Second one. One, two, three. Smile. All right, let me check the result. Wonderful smile from everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. All the questions that wasn't being able to be answered in time, uh, we, will, we will try to um, provide the answers and we will send it to you as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good